Your bride doesn't care about your problems. This is Wedding DJ School. I'm Josh Mitchell, your guide to the business of a wedding DJ. We're talking with leaders in the wedding entertainment industry. You're going to learn their backstories, how they got started, and where they are today. We're headed to New England to talk with Rob Peters. Rob is the owner and founder of Rob Peters Entertainment. His company is full-time and full-service. Beyond weddings, Rob and his team provide music entertainment and sound reinforcement for all kinds of events and for a variety of ages. They create the best events in New England, one celebration at a time. In today's episode, you're going to hear how Rob got into the game. You'll hear his backstory. We'll talk about Rob's custom budgeting system that he had to think through and the idea of taking a paycheck for yourself and charging what you're worth. Today's episode, you're going to learn about creating exceptional entertainment, and Rob is a great guy to learn from. You'll be able to find more about Rob at robpetersentertainment.com. But let's go ahead and meet Rob and hear all about his business. Uh, Rob Peters from Rob Peters Entertainment. We're located halfway between Boston and Providence. We are literally 10 minutes away from Gillette Stadium where the world champion New England Patriots play. And I kind of take pride in telling people that even though I'm not a dignified NFL fan, I'll watch it, but I'm more of a NASCAR guy. I've been doing this for 32 years now. I actually started in college and I've built Rob Peters Entertainment from just being me to being a full service entertainment company where we not only do weddings and parties and things like that from the DJ end, we also do corporate game shows. We do team building. We have photo booths. We have an extensive kids entertainment background as well. So we have bubble parties and clowns and magicians and face painters. So it's the whole gamut is what we, what we're trying to do here in Boston. That's fantastic. So what, how did you get started in that? Like, tell me a little bit more about those early days when you first started getting uh, kind of acquainted with this idea of getting paid to do this kind of work. Tell me about how all that started. It, it happened. It, a lot of stuff in my career happens by accident, Josh. And this was definitely, I guess, the beginning of that. I actually went to a small Catholic college up in Maine, right outside of Portland, St. Joseph's College. And prior to that, I was a very introverted guy. I wanted to be a television producer. I had gone to community access and I was doing great behind the scenes. I didn't want to be in the limelight at all. And when I went to college up in Maine, it was a really good fit. And they pair you up with an upperclassman. Well, the upperclassman that I was paired up with really took me under his wing and taught me how to DJ. And I actually had to fill in for him one night. And I discovered three things. Number one, I came out of my show really quick. Number two, I discovered girls like the DJ. And the third thing, I got paid for it. (laughs) So it started just on that one night and I got put in the rotation. I then did some radio and was DJing on the side and doing radio and pursuing a degree. And I wound up coming back to Boston not by choice, really. My career was set for me to stay in Maine and circumstances changed and I had to move back down here. And when I moved back down to Boston, I got rid of a lot of my DJ stuff and I was going to continue to try and get a career in radio, but I had to get a job. My parents were kind of like, you know, you're home, you got to pay rent, get a job. I got a job at a record store (laughs) and I was dating a girl at the time and she asked me to DJ for her and I was kind of not really in that zone, but she asked me to do it and she was dating me. I kind of felt like I had to do the right thing. So I went and rented gear and she and I hauled it all into a VFW hall and it was her sister's birthday. And I started DJing. I had a packed dance floor and I had people coming up to me asking me for business cards. Up until that moment, it had been five years, nobody had ever asked me for a business card. I didn't have any. I didn't know I needed any. So the next thing you know, I'm writing down my name and my telephone number on a cocktail napkin, and I'm handing them out to people, and my phone started ringing, and things just really took off for the early years. I did part-time for about seven or eight years when I moved back to Boston and then I quit my day job in 1998, my previous DJ full-time life 
I was a mutual fund transfer agent, which is a big fancy word for customer service rep in the mutual fund industry. And I was doing that and decided that I needed to make a go of this. I had a lot of encouragement from a mentor of mine and I left and I haven't looked back since. So what, like, tell me a little bit more about what was going through your mind when you first got some of those initial paychecks. Were you thinking, okay, I'm going to use this to, you know, to buy more equipment? How were you in terms of uh, using that, the funds that you were making? Um, were you just using that for kind of personal stuff on the side? Were you using it back in, in your business? Tell me about how you were thinking through that process of things. It was a little bit of money in my pocket, but I kept on reinvesting. I used to have Electronic Bargains, which was one of the big DJ store, independent stores in my market. And I would go in there and I would be like the kid right around this time of year. Once you got the big Sears robot catalog, I'm dating myself. But I would walk in there and I would go, wow, it'd be great to have, you know, an amp that didn't weigh 100 pounds. And gee, you know, this mixer from Newmark would be awesome and I'd love to have it. And I continuously just kept on reinvesting. I made it a point where I was taking a quarter of my pay and putting it in my pocket. And the rest of it actually went towards newer gear and more gear and just kept on redeveloping into marketing as well. I taught a lot of what I do. I'm sorry. I learned a lot about what I do on my own. I didn't have, and there really wasn't, I didn't know anything about DJ Times or Mobile Beat. There was really a very, you know, there was a very limited number of people that were willing to go out there and take people like me under their wing. And I was very fortunate that I had a few that did that. But I really wanted to focus on making sure that I had gear that was dependable and that sounded good and did the job. And I wanted stuff that I could say, I bought it on day one, I took it out of the box. Up until that point, I had been buying stuff that was used. I had some friends that were selling gear, and I would just pick that up just to get me through. And I just kept on developing and putting money more into the business. And at some point, I kind of looked at everything I had, and I actually had the storage unit full of gear. And I looked at it, and I said, you know, I probably should put some more of this in my pocket. So the tables turned a little bit, and I actually came up with a really cool budgeting system that allows me to be able to put money in my pocket and to be able to cover having to buy new gear, having to pay for brochures or business cards or internet or my wedding wire ad, any of that stuff, and still make sure that I have income left over at the end to cover anything that might come up unexpectedly. Is that a specific system that you learned from somebody else? Is that just something that you developed specifically for you? Anything else that, that you can share with us about that? I developed it on my own, Josh. I really took a good hard look at what we were charging. And this was before the Mark Farrell movement. This was when we were maybe getting $500 for a wedding. And I took a good hard look at it and I said, you know, the talent is the big thing. So I want to make sure I'm putting money in my pocket. I learned from talk show host Bruce Williams, who I met when I was doing radio in Portland. One of the things he said to me before I graduated, because he wanted to know what I was going to do now that I was moving back to Boston. And he said, if you go into business, make sure you take a paycheck for yourself first. And that's something that just resonated with me. And I see a lot of that in what I'm doing now. And I just developed this little checklist where I'm like, okay, $500. Okay. 250 of it's going in my pocket. What am I going to do with this remaining 150? I'm going to put a hundred towards any overhead I have. I'm going to put a hundred towards any gear that I might want to buy. And then I'm going to put 50 of it aside just in case I need something for a rainy day. So it was really something that I just developed on my own. That's fantastic, Rob. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's such a uh, an important learning for people to internalize uh, even early on in, in the business or early in, in starting off this mindset of what are you going to save for yourself? And it might not be possible to do that a whole lot in those early days, but really uh, being intentional about, okay, you're going to need some money for marketing. You're going to need some money for those promotional materials. You're going to need to reinvest in, in for other equipment. So I love that that was a part of your journey. And um, for those not uh, familiar with the Mark Farrell movement, um, could you just explain a little bit about that? Sure. Mark 
kind of help the DJ industry realize our role in the success of a wedding. And I remember when I first saw him, I saw him in Connecticut and he said something that was really profound because at the time, the cost for cheese and crackers and a veggie tray was more than what most DJs were charging for their services for a wedding. And it was a concept like that that made me realize that the cheese and crackers aren't going to get up and make everybody do the Macarena. You know what I mean? So um, Mark really helped educate the industry that we have a role. And in the relative scheme of things, we should be getting paid to be able to make a full-time wage. He really took the get what you're worth concept and continues to educate DJs today on making sure we're getting what we're worth and what is a fair wage. And he does a ton of education with that. And uh, I, I think it's, it's incredible. You had brought something up about the whole budgeting thing. The budgeting thing actually came from a transition point about 1996. I actually got a job at that DJ store I was looking at, and they used to bring me down to the DJ Time Show to sell on the show floor. We would show up on Sunday with box trucks full of gear, and on Monday morning, we would be on the show floor stacking them this high, and it was almost like you were going through this big flea market. <laughs> Excuse me. So. I would watch DJs come up and look at the mixer and go, I want to buy that mixer, but you know what? I got to go to the ATM and see if I have enough money to pay for it. And I'm like, what do you mean? You got to go check and see if you're going to pay for it. Well, I need to make sure I have the money for this. I go, okay, you don't already budget for that. No, no, no. I want to look at my bank account and see what I have because that's what I'm going to spend at this show. There were DJs who would look and say, I've got $1,000. I will buy that new piece of equipment for $1,000. And I'm like, how do you survive in a business like that? So, you know, like I said, between that and Mark, I really kind of felt my way into to making what I'm, what I'm working on now. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, and you've expanded beyond weddings and, and, and doing a lot of other things as well, which I think is just fantastic. Um, I do want to just uh, kind of... Uh, uh, revisit that in a second, but I'm still thinking of the person who is just starting off. I'm thinking of that person who is just kind of dipping their toe into the water a little bit, and they're hearing a lot of this stuff either for the first time, or they're really just thinking about like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that I could make a living at this. Um, speak a little bit more into just how, uh, if, if someone were starting off today, what encouragement would you give to them based on what you know now, just after all these years of, of kind of seeing it change and, you know, seeing things go from really heavy to now they're, they're more incorporated kind of speak into how would you encourage somebody on, on the front end of their journey i the two biggest tips i would give first one is be very modest and humble don't be afraid to go out and learn from other people and that leads me to the second thing find a mentor find somebody in your market who's willing to work with you and maybe mentor you, or better yet, maybe if they're a multi-op, go work for them for a little bit. Get your feet wet, get your education. And you never know, if they're treating you right, you're in the perfect spot. You don't need to worry about insurance and overhead and business certificates and all the other stuff that I worry about on a day and in taxes and all that stuff. But if you're going to venture it out on your own, make sure you a, save some money. Save some money if you're going to leave your day job and leave that security blanket. If you're married or engaged or your living situation is that where your income helps feed your household, talk it over with the other person. I've heard a lot of stories where uh, I had a guy who ironically came to me as a consultant. He said, yeah, I quit my day job. I said, it's awesome. He said, yeah, and I'm getting divorced at the same time. And I said, ooh. And he said, yeah, he said, I never told my wife that I was leaving my day job. And um, yeah. But if you're just getting started, don't be afraid of going to these shows and learning something. And it's not all about the gear. It's not all about the flashy controllers and the LED uplights and the fog and the smoke and all this stuff. 
and build your brand your way. Don't copy what other people are doing. Those are really the top tips that I would give to somebody starting out. And if anybody's in the Boston or Providence area, you're welcome to even reach out to me personally. If you're looking for that mentor kind of relationship, if you're not in that area, I am more than a phone call away. As I tell people, Josh, if you see me at the shows, I can be bought for lunch or a cup of coffee. <laughs> I really can. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, that's fantastic. And um, I, I have found as well that in this industry, people are willing to help. People are willing to, mm -hmm. to help you grow and to help you learn. And you're not alone in this. If you if you want to figure something out, there are people that are willing um, to, to help you. Um, uh, what are our um, um, I want to talk for a second just about mistakes or about, you know, think when things don't go quite right. And I think that that sometimes uh, there's a you said we have 30 yeah, minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we'll have to just, we'll have to pick a highlight for, for this segment. But um, True. I think sometimes there's a misconception that as you get more professional and more experienced, that all problems go away. And once you know everything, you just you execute on that. Um, talk for a little bit, either something recently or, or something that, that, that comes to mind for you, a mistake or when something didn't quite go as planned and just help kind of remind us um, how normal that is, but also kind of how, how you recover and how you think through that kind of stuff. There's a, a, I could probably, if I had a little more time, I could think some through. I was about 10 years into this business and I was at a very uh, prestigious event venue south of Boston. Up until the day of the wedding, I had only dealt with the bride because the groom served our country in the army. So I had only been dealing with the bride the whole time. I never met the groom until the day of the wedding. So we get to Mary and Jim's wedding, and we're doing introductions, and everybody's coming in. And when I introduce the bride and groom, I introduce them as Mr. and Mrs. Mary Smith. Mary Smith was the bride's maiden name. And people were clapping, like people were cheering. It wasn't until we used to have a, a code with my assistant where if they saw something that I didn't, they would step on my foot. So my assistant immediately comes over and steps on my foot and I go, what? He says, that's the bride's maiden name, it's John Jones. So I stopped the music. I get everybody into the moment, and I said, folks, we all know who planned the wedding, right? Now, let's give them a proper introduction. I had them go back to the doorway, and we did it all over again live. I took a lot of pride when the bride actually was convinced that I had actually planned that whole thing out. Because that was the running joke between her and her fiancé at the time, is you're planning everything. I'm just going to get off a plane, throw my uniform on and get married. Mistakes happen. That they, they happen in this business more often than not. Um, the, some of the best mistakes I've made are more of just trial and error when it comes to my marketing. I go and do something that I think is a great idea and doesn't go over well, doesn't get a return on the investment. They happen. And you have to be humble with it. The one thing that I can say, though, is own it. And I guess that's a big piece of advice is if you make a mistake, it wasn't the wind blew the wrong way. It wasn't that dog was barking in the background. It's on you. Even if it is somebody's indirect fault and it impacts you, better for you to own it and be responsible for it. It makes you look good in the end than to turn around and blame everybody else. And you're playing the blame game. Why? It's not worth it. Yeah, and that goes back to some of what you talked about earlier in terms of just being humble. And um, you, you don't know everything. And even after you may have been in the business for 10 years or, or longer or 20 years, like you having a posture of learning and always being able to improve and, um, hey, mistakes happen and being able to own those, it, it communicates actually professionalism. You think that it actually communicates, oh, that, oh, I'm falling apart and I don't know what I'm doing. But when you own when those things happen, um, it actually communicates, okay, I'm in this for the long haul and sometimes things go wrong. And I, I love your flawless execution. What a great 
story of uh, of the introductions going wrong because when you Google DJ horror stories at weddings, that's one of them that comes up is that the wrong name was introduced. And that's something that, you know, we can put that in the back of our mind and, and be proactive to make sure that you uh, don't do that at your wedding. But it's so cool how, uh, how you were able to make that work um, in, in your own special way and that the bride felt that it was all planned and everything. So I think that that's I just I love that. I, I, I think I knew them well enough, Josh, that I was like, OK, we can make this work. I put a lot of um, Disney into my company. I'm a big Disney fanatic um, and put a lot of Disney culture into how we run an event because I, there's a couple of things that I'm going to say that are going to shock some people. And one of them is your bride doesn't care about your problems. So don't make your problems her problems. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see DJs do when I'm watching all of these online forums, and I subscribe to about 30 of them. My Facebook feed is about 4,000 fans, and most of what I scroll through on a daily basis are the DJ forms. Don't look for an excuse. Don't be a scapegoat. Your bride doesn't care. This is the biggest day of her life, and she deserves, if she's writing you a check, to be able to write that check and know that you're going to do everything to make that day beyond what she's expecting. Talk to me more about that Disney idea. I, I love that. I, I want to hear a little bit more about that. When you say that you incorporate Disney in, into your company, what does that mean? I Well, a couple of different things. One of the big things that we're now, because we've expanded into a bunch of different markets, uh, one of the things that we do now is we make it a practice where, let's say you're doing an event from three to eight. And it, I'm talking corporate for, for the sake of argument. And you're going to be in the room at three, but you're really not doing dinner or anything till four o'clock. We're still setting up at three o'clock. So we're not walking through at three o'clock in the middle of your presentation. And now we look late. The event planner looks bad. If you go to Disney World, people are on stage all the time. And that's really what that comes down to. At, at RPE, we tend to. I tend to tell my crew, don't do anything in front of a guest that you don't think they wouldn't want to see. So if your phone rings, don't be standing behind the booth like this. Don't even be in the front for you like this. Go outside to an area that they can't see you somewhere off stage and take your phone call. That's what I talk about when I talk about bringing more Disney into it. I bring a culture of We've got you. Everything's going to be great. And we want to put the best face po possible when it comes down to it. You never see Disney cast members chewing gum. You never see a piece of paper sitting on the ground at any Disney park for more than a few seconds before somebody comes along and picks it up. So it's, it's a concept of be on stage and remember that you're on stage. Leave your personal whatever out of the way, do the best job possible for the client and give them an experience where they're feeling beyond what they ever expected. I love it. I'm a huge uh, Disney fanatic. And ever since Tom Peters first highlighted uh, Disney company in his book, In Search of Excellence, it's been uh, just such a, a uh, model of of what we can work towards, and I think the wedding industry and the entertainment industry, as as you're mentioning, in events that are outside of kind of the wedding world, um, we can learn so much. Not from you know, you, you're not going to show up with Mickey Mouse uh, ears, but it's the mindset of you know being on stage. And I think that DJs can definitely um, in, in the wedding world, you, you can take note of yeah, don't be on your phone behind the DJ booth looking like you're bored. You know, Disney employees think about they, they don't even call them employees; they call them cast members because because they're playing a part of the show and the show of the wedding day is that the DJ is the entertainer. They shouldn't be bored and, you know, sitting in the corner playing Angry Birds. Um, yeah, exactly. You, you, find, you find, though, that by bringing that approach in, your customers appreciate that a whole heck of a lot more. If you sit down with any prospective bride or any prospective customer, it doesn't matter if it's a wedding, and you say to them, tell me about an event you went to where the DJ was horrible. You can blink your eye and you're getting a story. But if you ask people, tell me about an event you went to where that was awesome because of the DJ, 
it takes a little bit. And part of it is our culture. Our culture is automatically go for the negative first. But if you're going for the positive, guaranteed that even though it's going to take a few seconds for people to remember you, they're going to remember that wedding because of you. It's not what you say. It's not what you play. It's how you made them feel. And that's really what's going to get you successful in this business. The other big saying that I always have is if you act like a professional, you present yourself like one, you're going to be respected like one, and you're going to be compensated accordingly. And I think those two things right there, because of the ease in which it is now for us, for people to get into the DJ industry, you can buy the music online, you can go to a wholesale club and buy speakers. And the, what I, I looked the other day, Home Depot's selling controllers online. It's becoming easier again. And it's not like the old days where you invested in a lot of music and you had to buy the whole album for 10 bucks. And you have record crates and a big coffin full of gear that was very expensive to go buy. And it wasn't like you could walk into a box store and go buy it. You had to go research where to get it. It's different now. So the new age of where people are coming in, if you take the professional road, you're going to stand out. Yeah, I think that's such a it's a good word to internalize that, you know, the, the gear is accessible. It's becoming more affordable. The The speakers are sounding better um, and they're getting lighter and easier to carry and, and set up and, and all of that kind of stuff. So the, the trick is really to learn the art of being an entertainer and not just, you know, somebody that shows up and presses play on a computer. So as you've thought about um, as you've grown your company from more than just weddings and, and that kind of thing, talk a little me uh, talk to, uh, a little bit to me and our audience just about um, that role of entertaining, just beyond DJing, because you're you're doing more than just uh, weddings now. So just tell me a little bit. You're just philosophy of of entertaining versus just playing music. Well, the big thing first of all is every one of your clients has done your job. They have pushed play on some kind of media player and played music for the enjoyment of others. That's our job by dictionary definition. Entertaining, it's being a good MC, being good on the microphone, being able to think quick on your feet. I was talking on, uh, I have a podcast that I run teaching DJs about more business stuff. And we were talking about holiday parties with Keith Allen the other day. And we were talking about things you should have in your toolbox getting educated and learning how to do things that are going to help you improve your job is going to make you a better entertainer. Get out from behind the system. It doesn't have to be the Rob show or the Josh show. It has to be about your client. So if you can get on a microphone, be able to think quick on your feet to make people enjoy what you're doing and make it so that it's not about you, you're entertaining whether it's a game or leading an interactive dance or um, at one of my trivia nights, we do cookie face, the game where you put the cookie on your forehead, you move it to your mouth. Just anything beyond getting people to dance because we're entering that age where we're getting a new crop of people. Let's, and I guess I'll just open this onion a little bit by saying the times are changing. When you go to a wedding, you're going to see a lot of older people, a lot of the millennials and the younger kids. They don't dance. They don't want to dance. They want to be on their phone. And how are you going to make that event happen if you've got an empty dance floor and you're just push and play? You've got to be able to do things like have a skill set, have some games or some activities or some kind of way to get that group into that moment. I love this, Rob. And make it about the customer. Yeah, I, I absolutely love this because, yeah, we're, we're entering a time where, you know, sorry to bring it back to Disney, but I just can't help myself because I love them so much. But, you know, e immersive experiences. People want to walk into Star Wars land or Toy Story land and be completely immersed into an experience. And they're not just content with, oh, listening to music or, oh, just, you know, hearing a quick speech. They want to experience something that's bigger than themselves. And we get to 
play a part in creating that. We get to create an environment or create an experience that's not just a one and done type thing, but it's something that everybody was a part of that if you weren't there, you would have wished that you were there. And something that is just easily shared in a picture isn't what we're going for. We're looking actually for more than that, that you had to be present in the room with the group of people. And that, you know, when you can create those kinds of moments that Seth Godin would call remarkable, meaning actually worth making a remark about, that that's what we're really trying to do. And, you know, as, as you were talking, a couple things that came to mind were, you know, um, I, I was a, a couple of years ago, we had a fashion show at our church and I volunteered to be the MC for it. And I this was even before, like, I, w I wasn't even thinking about that in terms of DJing. I was just like, oh, sure, I'll do it. And it's going through, and I'm not saying everybody should go DJ fashion shows or, uh, you know, MC fashion shows, but there's something about, you know, get out in the community and whatever is going on, you know, it might be trivia, it might be, you know, uh, a game night type of thing, and be where the entertaining is happening, even apart from the DJ controllers and the speakers, because there's something there that we can learn from and bring that back into our business because people want to experience something that's like that and it just I just love it so hear, hearing you talk about that I, I so agree that that is where the future is going and that's we need to cater to that we need to design our businesses in that framework and in that mindset of how can we create these immersive experiences where people are feeling something because they're ultimately going to remember what they feel not just what they heard and remember one thing on that line of what you're talking about if you're doing your job the right way and you're entertaining and your crowd's happy, you're going to be remembered. And the best marketing in the world is the one where somebody says, you got to hire Josh. He was the MC at our church's event. He was phenomenal. He played great music. He did a game to get everybody warmed up. You got to hire him. You can't put a dollar value on that. And it's funny how men, uh, we need to be in this business now more than ever because the economy is turning too. We need to be in this business where we're developing a relationship beyond the one and done. And it doesn't have to be sending out an anniversary card every year, which you probably should if you're trying to cultivate a relationship. It's asking for the referral. It's, you know, keeping up with them on social media. You don't have to stalk them, but, you know, when you know their anniversaries around, post it on their wall and maybe take it a few minutes of looking through and seeing, oh, wow, they had a kid. Awesome. Let's send them a card or let's do something else. And that's something that I think gets so overlooked. We go after the money, 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 money. We don't look at the fact that these are people, too. That's good. As we close, one last question for you. What is a goal that you're working towards, Rob, in your business or in your life, something that you are, are looking forward to in the next year or so? What's one, one goal that, that you're working on right now? Well, it's funny. You had alluded to the fact that we go beyond doing weddings and, and parties. We've developed RPE into multiple brands now. For example, think Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola owns Diet Coke, they own Sprite, they own Mug Root Beer. But basically, it's all Coca-Cola. So I have Rob Peters Entertainment. I have Game Show Parties of Boston, which is our game show division. I have the Bubble Music Man, which is our kids' entertainment bubble party stuff. We have our photo booth brand. My goal over the next year is to be developing my new talent and working more daytime work and letting my new talent work the weekend stuff because I got a 20 foot camper sitting in my driveway outside that I really enjoy using. And I kind of would like, if I'm going to go work the weekday stuff, I want to be able to have the weekend off and still be able to survive and have the company stay afloat. That's really the big goal that I'm working on right now. I love it. Well, thanks Rob for spending some time with us. It's just so encouraging hearing um, your passion and the energy that you bring, even just from this call, I, I can I can feel uh, that energy, and that's what we need more of. That's what um, I, I I hope it's contagious for other people, as it has been for me on on this call here today. Thanks for spending some time with us. Not a problem. Thanks for having me on. I look forward to uh, if any of your viewers that want to uh, reach out. They can reach out at uh, Rob at RobPetersEntertainment.com. I'll be glad to help in any way I can. I want to thank you so much for being a listener of Wedding DJ School. You can find us over at WeddingDJSchool.com. 
Also, you can text wedding DJ to 44222. We will ask for your email address, and in return, we will send you all of the podcast action guides for season one of Wedding DJ School. So you can do that for free just by texting wedding DJ to 44222. Lots of actionable advice that you can put to use right away all for free. Well, we're going to continue talking with leaders in the wedding entertainment industry. We will be back next week with a new episode. 